It's a delight to be here with you this morning during what I used to call when I was a student at Wheaton, Tribulation Week. You're in preparation for the final exam and I confess I never prayed for the Lord to come as hard as I did this week. My hope was that he would be here by Monday during reading day. Uh, what a wonderful way to end the semester. My own personal first encounter with spiritual warfare came when I was teaching high school physics and general science to 10th graders in Swaziland, now known as Eswatini. This is my 10th grade science class. It was a lazy, warm afternoon about two o'clock and when students are in love with science, yeah, exactly, one of you got it. One of them fell out of her uh, desk and began writhing on the floor. And my first thought, of course, was epilepsy. So we got her, stood up, walked her down to the vice principal's office. He had a couch and we lay her down. And I didn't think anything more of it, but then I started asking students, what was this? What, what did they see? Oh, this is love magic. It doesn't look like love to me. Well. A young man had wanted to have a relationship with the girl and she said no, so he went to a diviner who called up a spirit who would afflict the girl with this malady until she let him have a relationship with her. A dramatically different worldview from mine. This opened the door for me to begin thinking more clearly about spiritual warfare. And over the years, I have come to see Ephesians following the lead of New Testament scholar Clinton Arnold as a spiritual warfare primer. It's not an encyclopedia, but Paul is writing to a people he spent three years with. He really knew them well, but these were a people that were steeped in magical practices. We only have five instances in the book of Acts where demons are specifically mentioned, two of them taking place in Ephesus. The botched exorcism, on the part of the sons of Sceva, and then the uh, Paul's releasing people by what Luke calls extraordinary miracles, as if the ordinary miracles weren't enough. And it was his sweat rags as people would touch them. And this is where contemporary television evangelists sometimes get this crazy idea, send me a $10 gift and I will give you a blessing handkerchief of mine. What? That's kind of crazy. So as we look at Ephesians, I want to give you the foundation for the epistle here. Uh, everybody who studies Ephesians realizes that the first three chapters are doctrine and the last three are application. And the question I ask is doctrine for what? This is not Paul writing a random set of people and laying out the gospel per se, he's talking to a particular audience, a particular audience who had been wrapped up in all kinds of spiritual practices, uh, the types of things I would see in Africa. So the idea of a person wanting to have a relationship with a woman and the woman saying no and him calling up a spirit would not have been unfamiliar to the Ephesians. This is something they would have recognized. But in this first three chapters, I say, Paul, talks about God blessing, choosing, sealing us with every blessing in Christ. Christ is above all other rulers, powers, and authorities. And Paul says, and any name can be named. And there's a particular reason behind that phrase. Because in those days, as we see in many contemporary societies, if you know the name of a demon, you can control it. That's the belief system. And so the thought was, we buy these little amulets in which names of spiritual powers have been written and put inside, and we hang them around our, somewhat like a tie, we hang them around our throats, and then that spirit is supposed to protect us or give us whatever powers it's enabled us to have. And Paul says, any name you can name, Jesus is above them. He's directly addressing concerns the Ephesians have. You've been made alive with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. God's wisdom is shown to heavenly rules by Jews and Gentiles being reconciled into the church. And may God empower you to know and experience how unlimited Christ's love is. 
So I would say from Ephesians, the framework for me of understanding spiritual warfare is engaging the truth. Paul starts with the truth, then he moves on to the engagement. And so in chapters four, one through six, nine, live a life worthy of your calling. You've been called to Christ. I ask this question to myself, am I living a life worthy of that calling? God gave us church leaders to equip his people for works of service that we may all be joined together and grow into the fullness of Christ. Put off your old self and put on your new self. This is language that's used of a patient in a burn unit. Who to, you have to tear off the bandages and replace them daily. Otherwise, gangrene and affection will set in. So tearing off the old self is extremely hard to do. Putting on the festal clothes of Jesus, it's a struggle. I wish when I sat here like you, I thought, boom, I, sorry, I had an operation on my wrist so it doesn't work very well right now. Uh, I, I wish I could say, I am now spiritually mature and walk the rest of my life. I'm, I'm now 66 years old and I have found that life in the spiritual realm is a struggle. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. So he says, not just engage truth, but be filled. Sorry, I need to make sure I get to the right slide there. To be filled with the spirit, putting on Christ, taking off sin. And lastly, we come to this passage that we're talking about here to stand firm in God's word. John Mark Comer notes that this is a struggle, and that's the word that Paul used, our struggle against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil. And I would say the struggle takes place in three arenas. I'm following the, the lead of anthropologist, missiologist Charles Kraft in this. We have a struggle for truth, countering error and bringing people to correct understanding about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Was he just a guru? Was he just a wise person? Did he even exist? We've got all kinds of questions that have been asked about him. The challenge is finding the answer. But it's not just truths about Jesus, it's truths about God, countering error and bringing people to correct understanding about Jesus. Chapters four, are about worthy living. This is a commitment struggle. You know what the difference between I want to and I commit to? I want to lose weight. But I'm committed to carbohydrates. <laughs> That's a challenge for me. I have been diagnosed with COVID-29. I'm hoping it doesn't turn to COVID-39. Some of you finally got it. Uh, <laughs> what are you committed to? I was part of a men's Bible study, and one of the realities we struggle with is what are you really committed to? And part of the, the, the reason behind this group was to really open up to each other as men. As a matter of fact, we had to start each week by telling each other what we felt. I had been raised to think that I had no feelings. Well, of course I did but that was the grammar that I learned growing up. And through the two years working through this, I realized I can feel happy and sad at the same time. I can own my anger when I'm angry. I can feel shame and acknowledge that before Christ. But the commitment also asked us to say, what were you failing in? And in a group of six men, all in the middle 40s to middle 50s, uh, it wouldn't surprise you to find out that one of the challenges that men faced was pornography. And we would report weekly to each other how we were doing. I fell this week. I was okay this week. But you know, if a person fell several times, the leader would eventually ask, what do you really want? Because you're living something that's different from what you say you want. I should stop viewing pornography. 
and the leader would say, you are full of should. Okay, a few of you got that, yes. <laughs> and that was one of my problems, I was full of should. When I need to be full of commitment and to acknowledge more honestly what was going on in my heart. Does this sound like a struggle to you? And the last struggle is the struggle over, uh, sorry, power. Demonstrations of authority over the power of Satan and demons that bring freedom to the oppressed. Again, the reality of this power, I had a counselor call me one day and say, I've got a woman who's dissociative, and I think maybe one of the fragments or one of the dissociated memories is demonically infested. I said, how did you know? She said, the presence of evil was so strong in the room that when it came out, I threw up into my own trash can. This is the therapist saying this. I said, okay, well, that's reasonable evidence. So let's see what we can do. And, and we set up a time and we put her in a church and she was at a stage where through the counseling, she was whole enough to want to be released from this force. And so when it came time to cast out the demon, I just said, it's time for you to go. No, it's not. Like a petulant three-year-old. Mine, mine, mine. Our African friends often complain that's the first word Americans learned. Mine. And we didn't turn into a shouting match. There was no need. We had the authority of Christ and the woman wanted to be released. So we just said, go, and it did. And it was a calm presence came over the woman and she realized it was gone. One of the things I want you to see is there's a purpose behind the way I have drawn these boxes. And in the vocabulary and the, if, that Paul uses in Ephesians, roughly 90% of it is spiritual growth and 10% is power. And I found that true in spiritual warfare as a whole. 90% is understanding truth, being committed to the right things, and 10% is the pyrotechnics or the fireworks. And you know what I found also? The 10% is the easiest part because it's one and done. The 90% is the hardest part because it's a continual struggle. Some of you who deal with pornography right now are saying to yourselves, you know, when I get married, that'll all be behind me. No, it won't. Because it's a life struggle, not a season of life struggle. Apart from the power of Christ, it's a challenge you're going to face. And that doesn't feel like good news, does it? But I'm speaking from the vantage point of having sat in those seats over 40 years ago. And the reality is, this is a challenge we face. What are you committed to? So let's look now at the weapons that we have. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Uh, Sipo was a person who came to see me when I lived in Kenya and taught there. And he t told me my brother's demonized. I said, well, how do you know your brother's demonized? He said, because he came home drunk one night and I started preaching to him and he hit me. I said, did you think maybe your preaching at him while he was drunk was the wisest course of action you could have taken? Uh, and perhaps he wasn't really demonized, but he was just angry at you for preaching to him when he's drunk? I had my own struggle with truth at times. This is a picture taken in a Wheaton apartment, Wheaton College apartment. Painters went into the room to paint it and the, one of the painters said the presence of evil was so tangible in the room, I, I couldn't even go back. So, so they didn't go back to paint it. So someone who likes to investigate this type of phenomenon, and it wasn't me, uh, went into the room and he said the little squiggly line you see coming up, that's the LED on top of a recorder. He was recording to see if he could hear anything and suddenly the line starts squiggling up. Uh, that round circle, that could have just been a reflection off the flashlight from the camera lens on the back wall. But 
I try to understand this phenomena. Some of you say, well, the camera jiggled. Well, no, it didn't because the chair and the tables are perfectly in focus. I have, as a physicist, no physical explanation for this, and I trust the person who took it that he didn't just simply doctor it up later. He was actually an employee here at the college. After he took these pictures, he simply said, Lord Jesus, you're over this room. Any demonic entities that want to scare Wheaton students or to use this room for their activities, get out of here because this institution belongs to Christ and this room belongs to Christ. We chose not to tell, this happened during the summer, we chose not to tell any students about it because you can imagine what goes on in the imagination of people living in a room like this and we've not had a problem with it. Stand firm then, Paul says, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Robert came to talk to me about issues he had. He said, every time I get into a fight with my wife, I, I go get in the car and then I find myself at a place of prostitution. Oh, really? You find yourself there? Did you ever consider that getting into your car was the problem to begin with? And once you got into your car, you had already made the decision of what you were going to do? No wonder you found yourself there. Have you ever talked about the possibility of having a safe room in the house where you can go when you're angry rather than getting into the car and going to a place that you shouldn't be going to? I have a secret I don't want you to know. My grandfather was a dirty old man. My father was a dirty old man. I fear that legacy. By the grace of God, I'm not, though I'm old, not dirty. Because I want to start a new legacy for my children. I want to be a clean old man who loves Jesus. But the idea that I've got ancestors that were engaged in pornography and peep shows and you name it. Oh, it's horrible. And it's shameful to admit it. But the reality is when I do, it loses its power over me. You've all heard me say it now. It could be a source of shame for me or by God's grace, a source of strength for me to continue to live a life that's not pushing me in the direction of becoming a dirty old man. Maria struggled with the gospel of peace. She would wake up having a, a weight on her chest and it was like a demonic presence was there. She said she had over a hundred visitations in, in a two year span. And a friend told her, well, look, if you take the Bible and put it on your, on your bedside, it, it will help. And she did that. Um, and, and, and it worked for about two weeks. Then they started coming again. Well, look, why don't you open it to Mark chapter 5, the story of the Gadarene demoniac, and that will help you. And, and she actually put it under her pillow. Do you understand what this is? It's a form of Christian magic. I said, why don't you, instead of doing that, ask God to be sovereign over your dream life? Ask God to be the one who rules your dreams. And I saw her about five years after that, and she said, that did it. I commit my dream life to God every night now. I'm curious, how many of you commit your dreams to God? We usually think of dreams as the throwaway third of our lives over which we have no control. And we all know the source of bad dreams. It's pepperoni, it's anxiety, or perhaps it's the enemy of our souls. But giving our dreams over to Jesus, I think is an important spiritual exercise. June struggled over faith. Take up the shield of faith. June started, he, he prayed to have a spirit tell him about what was going to happen. And suddenly he started hearing voices and it had telling the future and the future kept coming true. And 
June said, but eventually, I knew he was coming to me because there was something wrong, but June coming to me said, they are now telling me they're gonna destroy me. I said, well, would you like to get rid of him? Yes, I would. I'm a firm believer in discipling people rather than doing it for them. So I wanted June himself to pray to send those voices to leave and he refused to do it. We went through this several times and finally I asked him, why aren't you sending them away? He said, because they might tell me something I need to know. Do you hear where his commitment is to these voices who were telling him? And, and he left my office and I've never seen him again. Uh, spiritual power encounters can end in spiritual power failures because not every story is a success story. Unfortunately, not every success story is a success story. Mike struggled over salvation. He called me one day and he said, I ate a chicken sandwich for lunch. Am I going to hell? Okay, Mike, give me a little bit more context behind that. <laughs> uh, you know, is chicken evil? <laughs> you know, did it include the chicken livers? What, what did you do? He said, oh, um, I, pr I took a vow this morning that I wouldn't eat anything and I, ate a ch and I broke the vow by eating a chicken sandwich. Am I going to hell? He didn't understand the great gift of salvation that was for him. He needed to be able to put that on and understand this helmet that he had. Lastly, Letitia's struggle over the word of God. Her father was suffering from a mental illness and he would get angry and she came to me, is this a, possibly a demon? I said, well, let's test it out. I said, the next time he starts to get angry, under your breath so he can't hear you, just say, stop it. And see what happens. Demons have good hearing. And she tried it out and a month later she said, nothing happened. She was relieved because she realized it was the disease that was speaking, not demons that were speaking through him. There's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in spiritual warfare. And you notice I haven't even gone into the description of the armor because it's about the struggle that you and I have over these areas in our life that Paul says is important for us to overcome. Finally, just as Paul uses the word stand four times in this section of the epistle, he uses the word pray four times. In an atmosphere of prayer, engage your struggles. I would love to pray with some of you. If you want to come see me, I'm, I'm down on the other side of the street in Billy Graham Hall. I'm on the second floor west corner, or east corner office right across from the bathrooms. Uh, but if you want to come see me and we can set up some time to pray, I'd love to do that with you and help you think through things and walk through things and talk through things and perhaps commit through things. God bless you in Jesus' name.